This is the DMT One to One Show, episode 28, on the 24th of September 2013. An interview with Michael Durnberg, CEO and co founder at Reverb Nation. And the DMT One to One this week is sponsored by Sheridan's at sheridan's.co.uk. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DMT One to One Show. And it's great this week to have on the show Mark Durnberg, who is the co founder and CEO at Reverb Nation. So, hi, Mike, and great to have you on the show. How's it going today? Thanks, Andre. It's great to be here. Nice to stay here in North Carolina. Yeah, it's a pretty nice day here, uh, here in London as well. We had a bit of a second win in, in the summer department, so we thought that the autumn was uh, pretty much uh, on its way, but uh, it's about 22 degrees, so it's, uh, it's pretty good. And, uh, and so it's uh, great to have you on, and it's great to talk about Reverb Nation. It's a company that's a, sort of a staple of the digital music uh, landscape for the past few years, uh, and you guys started in 2006. And so, uh, uh, first of all, I, I would imagine most people, like 90%, 95% of the audience that is listening to the show would know what you guys do, but uh, just to make sure that everybody's caught up, uh, what does Reverb Nation do in a nutshell? Great. You know, Reverb was founded in 2006 really with the, with the goal of empowering the independent artists. We um, really are trying to tip the scales in their favor given you know, the changes that happen in the music business. Um, we provide a lot of core tools and services a band needs to run their business. Whether they yeah. get the music on iTunes, manage your fan list, create your own mobile application, or advertise on top sites like billboard.com. You know, I think that, you know, the, the bigger idea, though, is really how do we take all of these artists that are, when you aggregate them together, are tremendously powerful, can influence things in tremendous ways, and, and really create opportunities for them, opportunities to be signed, opportunities to be licensed, opportunities to be sponsored. And so we really feel like our, our mission is really to provide the foundation that an artist can build a career on. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, how did the idea for the company start? You know, did, did you start out with a particular angle when you started the, the company? Uh, you know, looking at, for example, pro providing uh, a, a portal for EPKs and, and sort of promotions for the band? Or did you, did you already have this sort of uh, all-rounded, all-encompassing uh, uh, view on the company when you, when you started it? It's interesting. This is actually my third software company I started. And this one has stayed remarkably true to its original thesis. And... Right. Um, you know, I think that there were some key ideas early on that we wanted to embrace. The first was that the music business was changed forever. And that the idea that a song was going to be worth a dollar or a dollar twenty nine was going to change. There was just too much music being created. And so we saw a lot of that, you know, really way back when we started the company, that if things were going to change. It was going to be a lot more about where music was used more than how it was purchased. And you can see that happening today, you know, whether it be Pandora, whether it be Spotify, whether it be, you know, the way brands are using music. I think for us, there were some, some big ideas. The first was that bands, we needed to be able to provide low-cost products. Bands didn't have a lot of money to invest. And we felt that we needed to provide an integrated suite of services, a set of tools that all work together. For example, an email, an email platform that could, you could play your songs from. And these were really key ideas. The second was we wanted to be able to provide free tools to the really early artists. We wanted to be able to give them a way to get started. And we didn't want to have to charge them right out of the bat. And I think the third idea was we really believed that by that as valuable as the bands were as customers, what was really valuable was that we could aggregate their data and use it in really interesting ways. And to this day, we now we have 3.1 million bands. We manage about 75 million fans on their behalf. And these become powerful, powerful levers to help the artists create opportunity. Absolutely. And I get bad emails from bands all the time asking me, you know, there's so many things out there. I'm so confused as to what I should be doing, where I should be, you know, all these tools out there. And I guess uh, one of the things that Reverb Nation does in, in helping them is providing a, a more consolidated experience so that they don't have to try and catch up with 50 different sites, but they have one, one place to, to at least have a base to start with, right? That's certainly our mission. Um, you know, it's still, you know, there's so much noise out there. There's so many tools. Uh, even on Reverb, as easy as we try and make it, it's still complicated. You know, most bands are trying to make music. They're trying to be artists. And, yeah. you know, running the business of being a band isn't really what they signed up for. They really signed up to be an artist. So I think that, you know, we try and make it easier. We do our best. We're always listening to the artists trying to add new features or education, sort of ed sort of educational type of features that are in the site. But um, yes, yeah, it, being a band these days is complicated. It used to be you made a few, you know, you made a record, 
you know, you, you shopped it around, you got signed, and you became rich and famous. And that was sort of the uh, the end of it. But now it's you have to be a lot. You have to be a very very sophisticated digital marketer. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you offer a variety of tools on Reverb Nation that are, are pretty interesting, you know, so uh, on, on the social front, you've always been very active in trying to, uh, on, on the communications front, in trying to provide uh, the best possible solution to artists to email their fans, but also to aggregate the emails that, uh, that, their fa that the artists might uh, have or might uh, be able to aggregate through social networks but might not know how to do that. Uh, so, so how does that work? Uh, and, and uh, on the on the email collection front, how do you help artists collect the most emails possible? Well, we look at we look one of the things when we look at early on MySpace was big, and one of the things that they were trying to do was they were trying to you know allow people to become fans of bands. We never particularly liked that model because you essentially were using they were using your music to create fans for another site. So what we try and do is we try and allow each piece of an artist's content, every time somebody shows interest in that band, use it as an opportunity to allow that band to establish a relationship directly with that band. So, for example, we were the first company ever to introduce, you know, exchange a song for an email. And it was something that introduced that interest a long time ago. We did things like light dating on Facebook very early on. If you wanted to listen to songs, if you wanted to download songs, you had to establish a light relationship. And then we would turn around and get the artist's email address, our fan's email address for you. So this has become something that's been systemic within Reverb since the very beginning. And I think it really goes to a, a really foundational idea, which is that a band, primary mission when they get started, long before they ever want to sell anything, long before they're ever thinking about really doing anything financially, is really to establish a fan base. Yeah. And one of the best, and, and, and you know, unlike sort of a lot of products where you can make an investment in advertising or you can do things where you're trying to sell a product that potentially has high value. You need to be able to leverage your social relationships to create a much richer fan base. So being able to take advantage of social essentially allowed artists to acquire fans at a relatively low cost. So that's yeah. really central to everything we do. Absolutely. And uh, looking at the strategy of the company through your... Uh, in the last uh, year, year and a half, uh, mobile, of course, is becoming a pretty important place to be. Uh, a lot of fans, according to the latest stats, are looking for, for bands on mobile. And so you provide a couple of solutions for that as well. Uh, I think it's it, they're part of two of the premium tiers that you have on Reverb, Na Reverb Nation. And one is the Android uh, app and the other one is the iOS side. So how did you introduce those two uh, applications and what's your approach when you, when you look at mobile for bands? Well, mobile, you're right. You're absolutely right. Mobile is becoming enormous. And, you know, sometimes thinking about mobile just as mobile is maybe a little bit um, too broad. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there's phones and, you know, there's smart smartphones and how people interface. There's tablets. And, you know, those aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, for us, it's really about trying to provide the right content at the right time for the right audience. So you're right. So we, we have a variety of mobile solutions and you should expect a lot more from us over the course of the coming, over the coming really next six months. But some of the ones we have today are um, we provide artists their own mobile application so they can really present that to their fans. Um, we have an Android version and an iOS version. You can actually get the Android version for free. And then you actually pay to have it put into the download store. Yes, you can go to Reverb today, create your own Android application, and then make it available within your own website. If you want to make it in, make it part of the Play Store, then you do have to um, then you do have to pay to have that done. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's really about trying to make every aspect of the site mobile friendly. Um, on the artist side, we have the artist control room application that allows them to do things like send an email or to sign up a new fan when they're at a show. So we're trying constantly to try and make mobile a bigger and bigger part of what we do. Absolutely. And looking at um, live, of course, it's been a, it's been a, a strong part of your growth. Uh, uh, you have a lot of promoters that use Reverb Nation and a lot of bands that use it to send EPKs out and, and secure gigs. Uh, and you've have always had a, a strong relationship with, uh, with um, uh, small venues as well to uh, help uh, your bands secure slots in, in some of the venues in LA, New York and, and across the US, uh, really. Uh, so looking at that and the evolution of uh, live, uh, do you feel like you have more control than ever on 
where your fans are uh, and how or, or where the, the band's fans are and how best they can capitalize those location data that the location data in order to secure the gigs in the most interesting or or, or, or profitable spots for them we, you know, we, we did a survey of um, our artists i believe it was um late last year where you surveyed something like about 40 or 50 thousand artists not all of them but we surveyed about 40 50 thousand artists across the world and what we're trying to do is understand which opportunities they were most sought after. Yeah. And this was across publishing. It was across live. It was across every aspect of, of, of the business. And then what we did was we, you know, figured out which ones were the, the most frequently asked for. And then we've gotten our live group out of New York to go out and seek those opportunities. You know, for us, there's a big question mark when you when you start talking about providing opportunities to live. A lot of the the business um, that was started originally by Sonic Bid was really a pay for play model. You would yeah. have to submit, you would have to create your case submission fees. We tried from very early on to get away from that with really the idea that said, look, if we're going to give the promoters, if we're going to, we're going to provide the promoters real marketing muscle because these artists can reach a tremendous number of people. Then what we expect is that the, the slots or the opportunities to be provided for free by the, by the promoter. And that's worked out really quite well. We've had bands that um, who were constantly looking for new opportunities. We have seven people in New York. That's all they do is seek out those opportunities. And yeah. we've had a lot of success. I mean, I, someone somebody told me recently that I guess Imagine Dragons is one of the original, was, was originally, uh, they won one of the opportunities and you saw what happened to them. So we've had a lot of success. You know, it's hard. There's, there's not enough opportunities for all the bands that are out there. Yeah. So we do our best to try and, you know, find opportunities for as many of them as we can. Yeah, of course. And uh, and uh, looking at uh, uh, the way you, you did, did you do the distribution as well, uh, that's, a, that's a part of the services you offer. So you distribute, uh, I think, as part of the subscriptions. Uh, if, you are, if you are a paid, paid user, you can, so you can release up to two releases a year for free through Reverb Nation. And so uh, that's, that's a big part of what you do. Uh, but uh, talking to a lot of distribution companies and uh, a lot of companies that are doing similar work, uh, work in terms of uh, trying to aggregate some of the band's data, uh, the question always comes up as to whether streaming services uh, should be doing more to try and surface more information about the artists and about who they are, especially for unsigned bands. There's been a big debate in the last few weeks uh, uh, in terms of what these services can do to help artists a little bit more. So, so do you feel like there is room to expand uh, on uh, for, uh, from the streaming services parts as well to try and provide some more data like like for example some of the data that you have uh, uh, or, or try and facilitate the uh, sales of merchandise and, and other types of goods uh, to help uh, uh, unsigned artists uh, uh, make a living absolutely i mean i would love nothing more than to provide companies like spotify and pandora a rich set of information that they could present within their interface um, you know, thing, for example, I think we have the largest provide or the largest, um, we have the largest database of upcoming show information in the world. So can you imagine that as you're listening to a band, that their show schedule, the shows that are right near, near you are coming up? Can you imagine we have musician pages where individual, where bands have each individual artist, the guitarist, the drummer. They each have a presentation of their band and can show of, the, of themselves and can show the other projects they're working on. Can you imagine Spotify? If you could dig deep down into these bands and learn a tremendous amount about each one of the members, it would yeah. be it, it would create a familiarity and create a real interest in, in some really good bands. I mean, really, really amazing bands. If you look back at Reaver five years ago and you look at some of the bands that were on, they're all some of these bands are, are huge today. Um, you know, Lady Antebellum was one of the early bands on our, our site. The Civil Wars, and the list goes on and on and on. Imagine getting those bands five years before their day. And how, for, from a listening experience, I, I think that's what a lot of us are looking for, is we want to yeah. have, you know, we want to be able to go and, and find music that we haven't heard before that isn't being presented for us. So I would be very supportive of that. I would argue that the a lot of the streaming services today are struggling with much bigger problems. Yeah. Specifically, you know, how do they make, make the economics of their business work? Especially in light of companies like Apple and Google really starting to present their own services that are ultimately going to be very competitive with uh, some of the pure plays like Spotify and Pandora. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And of course, uh, Spotify and, and audio and the likes are, are fantastic tools for discovering bands uh, that are playing, for example, South or Southwest or the upcoming CMJ. You can find a playlist with all the bands that are playing there. You can sample at least one track from all of them. But there is a distinct lack of, lack of information on what they do, who they are. And most of them don't, don't have a bio yet or a profile on, 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 on Spotify. So, uh, yeah, it would be awesome to be able to see uh, a bit more of the information for early early stage artists, uh, artists as well. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, uh, how bands are relating to the to the fans, uh, of course, uh, there's a big emphasis on trying to maintain a direct relationship with Rever Reverb Nation through uh, mailing lists. Uh, as far as uh, uh, artists' relationship with the networks like uh, Facebook, for example, uh, that has had a lot of uh, sort of... Uh, uh, criticism uh, has come under quite a bit of criticism lately for the way it, it's handling the relationship between uh, uh, bands and and their fans. Uh, so uh, how uh, is the what, what's the temp what's the temperature what's the what's the mood uh, amongst artists these days uh, as far as uh, their relationship with Facebook and the way that they uh, you know they need essentially to to pay to reach uh, the majority of their fans. Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, yeah. So it's, it's interesting, and I want to be fair to Facebook, but I want to be honest about it. Um, you know, we have a pretty deep relationship with Facebook. We're one of the largest. We, 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 we buy a tremendous number of ads on Facebook on behalf of those artists. You know, Facebook is trying to balance a bunch of things. They're trying to balance sort of the economics of their business. Um, you know, if they let everybody talk to everybody free, then that's not a very good business model. And the uh, other <laughs> problem is that they... You, you end up with a lot of people really spamming the system. And, you know, you see this, and this isn't, this isn't unique to just Facebook. I mean, LinkedIn does the same thing. But, you know, I think Facebook is getting harder for a band to use. Um, you know, they, they, downplay, they sort of downplay the applications that used to be, the apps that used to support the bands. They're now several clicks away to get some of the relevant information. They really kind of, own the initial presentation to um, to a user that's made it very difficult for a band to do more than really talk to them as friends, and that they really can't talk to them as a band. And then, of course, you know, in order to you know to amplify your messaging within your your your, your friend base, it's or within your social graph, it's 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 challenging because not all friends are created equal. And you know, and and I think that. So it goes back to an early idea, something that really goes all the way back to MySpace, which is you don't want your fans, you don't want to rent your fans. You don't want your fans to be owned by somebody else. And while sending them emails every day may not be the, may not be the optimal way to talk to them, you certainly want that as an option because yeah. you, control, you control the experience. You know, for us, we're constantly looking at whatever the, the, the social networks and the, all the really the social interfaces and trying to help bands take advantage of it. Facebook is interesting because Facebook used to be a much more powerful way for a band to communicate with their fans. I would argue today, not quite as much. Is yeah. that a good choice? I think that for Facebook, they have other things that are balancing that. For the band, I would argue Facebook isn't quite the powerful tool it used to be. Yeah, it's, it's still a fantastic tool, of course, to... That is, uh, is essential to be on because uh, so many people are on it. But uh, yeah, I'm hearing increasingly bands that are, are torn between uh, trying to di communicate directly and, and communicate uh, through Facebook to, to, towards their fans. And uh, uh, looking at uh, some of the more uh, sort of out there things that you do, like one of the interesting things that I was looking at was the crowd review uh, feature as well on Rever 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 Reverb Nation. And I I've heard uh, a similar feature like being uh, done by a few other companies, but, but you have a really great sort of price point as well uh, that you offer to bands so you know, you know it doesn't feel like you're overcharging them at all and uh, and so i wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, how that came about and, and how that the scheme works uh, what the kind of feedback you're getting from the bands i'll tell you I, it's a it's a product that when we introduced it i was unsure as to how um how it would be received yeah. um i i can say it's been an overwhelming success I, I think that's true for a few reasons i think the first is that um, it helps surface good bands, you know, bands that are really ready to be presented to the world. And I, I, I've been sort of overwhelmingly impressed by the quality of some of the bands. What it does for the for the fit for the for the bands that maybe need some work, is it really helps them refine the areas of their of their of their art that maybe needs work, um, whether it be in the vocals or whether it be just in the instrumentation. It could be a variety of things. 
What I've been most impressed about was the wisdom of crowds. So when you get enough people really talking about these bands and the, the feedback they give, and when you use statistics to really sort of understand it, it's very compelling. We have a, a group that's part of our uh, that's part of our industry, sort of our, our upcoming industry services group that's sort of professional A and R people, and that listen to a lot of the bands on Reverb, and that's increasing to the point where we're going to be listening to every band that comes into Reverb, looking for opportunities for them, which is a huge undertaking because we Absolutely. get between ten and fifteen thousand songs a day. So <laughs> yeah, so it's hard, you know. But we're, we're we're learning how to do that. But the thing that's interesting about crowd reviews is that when we expose the crowd reviews to those professional a and r people, they, they by and large say, wow, that's pretty accurate. So I think it's an incredibly powerful tool, and it's certainly helped us um, figure out what to present to the fan. Yep. It's, helped, um, it's helped us talk to the bands more readily about the products that are make sense for them, because based on where they score, it determines what are the best products for them. And ultimately we want to put the best products. We want to put the right products in the right hands. So it's been, it's been a really cool product. Yeah, sure. And turning the tables around to the to the user experience uh, of the fans that are, are going to the Reverb Nation site, uh, I, I really like the fact that you know I went to ReverbNation.com and it showed me the bands that were trending in in London or charting, you know, sort of in my local area. So, uh, h- how does that affect the way that fans interact with the the site and and perhaps discover bands that wouldn't be discovered otherwise? Well, you know, it's interesting. We um, so. We, when we built Reverb, we never really built Reverb as a fan destination site. It just wasn't what we set up to set out to do. I mean, you know, there were other companies that were doing that. I think because so many fans, you know, we band, so many bands use it, and so many bands direct their fans there, we end up with a significant number, significant, significant amount of traffic. I think in the in the U.S., I think we're um, in the top 700 sites on, in the U.S. and maybe the top 1,100 sites in the world. And that's all because the artists send their fans there. So over time, we continue to develop the fan experience. Um, the in, one of the things that's interesting about the fan experience is we, because we have so many people come to the site, I think we have close to 20 million unique people come to the site a month, we're able to leverage that. And so we've um, recently we began sending um, emails out to fans about um, artists that are sort of up and coming. And it's really helped move the needle for them. I mean, in some cases, doubling, doubling and even tripling their fan base, but almost always growing at 20 to 30 percent. So I think a lot, for a long time, a lot of people have used reverb to find bands, including the industry. You know, you find, we find A&R people looking through reverb. We find licensing people looking through reverb. So when we think about the fan or we think about the listener, what we're really thinking about is, how do we create opportunity for the artists through the listener more so than how do we create a revenue stream from it? We're not looking to create Spotify or not even looking to create an ad support site. We're really just looking to, to aggregate the bands and, and, and make them available to the bands that are on Reverb. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it makes makes total sense. And uh, and so looking at the at the scale of the artists as well, you were talking about so many artists that got big or Reverb, Reverb Nation. Uh, you know, uh, do the artists actually stick around for uh, for some some of the services like the mailing list uh, management, for example? Uh, do, do you see some of the bigger artists stick around the uh, Reverb Nation as well? I would say I would say certainly we have artists that maintain their presence, but I would say when your band your band graduates, yeah. um, you know, if you look like I, I'm, a, I'm a, I I don't ask you before if you're a football fan, I'm a big 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 you know you're a big football fan, and um, if you look at a lot of the academies that play. And, and they play in around, you know, you're, they, 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 some of the best academies aren't the big clubs. Yeah. And they ultimately graduate. They move to Man U, they move to Chelsea, they move to the Spurs. And I think that we're no different. You, people graduate from Reverb. They, they end up moving on and they get signed and they need services that are probably beyond what we offer them. There's a, for example, in distribution, um, I don't know if people know this, but when you distribute the reverb, you're really distributing through universal distribution system. So you get all the benefits of that. But if you're a band and you want to do, you want to release at different times in different territories, we're not the right solution for you. And so typically bands will graduate as they become more sophisticated or they need just a higher level service. Yeah, of course. 
course. And finally, I just wanted to ask you about the future for the company. Uh, uh, you were talking about the plans for mobile in the next uh, six months or so. Uh, anything else that is on your aid radar uh, in terms of high priority items? Yeah, you know, um, we recently just released actually Stigma Mobile. We recently just released a, a, a mobile version of a product that's been very, very successful um, on the web on the website called Gig called Gig Finder, which allows bands to find it. Now there's a mobile application that you can download. I believe it's available right now just on iOS that allows you to uh, a band to find gigs. And we're going to continue to innovate around those services. Look for some very, very interesting new new services. Um, for the band. I think the thing that um, really interests me is what we're doing around curation, around yeah. trying to identify artists and trying to find opportunities for artists. So we're starting to make pretty big investments into sorting and filtering artists. Our goal is that within the first 60 days of the band joining the site, that they are somebody, a professional level of A&R is listening to them and identifying the opportunities that might be best for them. And then that will go to inform a lot of the products and services that we, we provide, whether it be to the fan, whether it be to people within the industry. And so look for a lot more around trying to take and identify artists early in the process. Obviously, the more they use us, the more information we have about them, the easier it is to identify who the best fans are and, and, and what they're good for. Not all bands are looking to be signed. Some, you know, some bands are better for licensing. Some are great songwriters, but don't necessarily not really great performer. So we're trying to identify that and trying to look for ways to create opportunity for that. And I'm very, very excited about the business. You know, we've been we've been very fortunate. The business has enjoyed tremendous growth. I think we're at 85 people right now. Um, we have uh, we, there's been a really strong financially, and it's really put us in a position. I think change the way the music business works in, in really profound and, and, and positive ways. So, so look for some interesting things from us, hopefully in the not too distant future. That's great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for uh, being on the show. And it's uh, ReverbNation.com, of course, uh, for all the listeners who want to check the uh, site out. And I highly recommend that you do. And uh, this has been uh, the DMT One to One show. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, you can find more information on the site on DigitalMusicTrends.com or follow us on at DigiMusicTrends. Uh, thanks again, Mike. Uh, great to have you on. Thank you, Andre. And thanks for listening. Have a great week. And until next time. And now a short information piece recorded with DMT's sponsor for this show, Sheridan's. I'm here with Tahir Bashir from Sheridan's and uh, uh, we're going to continue our series of segments by talking about digital service providers or DSPs. And on the show, of course, you know, we, we talk about DSPs a lot uh, and uh, namely they, we call them startups most of the time. So, <laughs> uh, so first of all, uh, let's go back, uh, let's backtrack to the history of, uh, you know, the, the music industry or, and startups and technology. There's always been a bit of suspicion there. Uh, and, uh, you know, why do you think that is? Well, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I think, you know, historically there's always been this concept that uh, with any kind of DSP, it, you know, the seen as disruptive technologies, uh, which effectively is seen as a threat because ultimately if the technology changes the way that everybody's been doing, uh, carrying out their activities in the music industry, then that means that certain people won't have jobs and uh, there's certain income streams which change. So, you know, from my perspective, right from the start when, when I got involved, with a whole load of DSPs, you know, many, many years back, it's always a co concept of trying to change that uh, issue of it being a threat and trying to turn that into it being an opportunity. Yeah. And so that's essentially, you know, the, the best strategy for any startup that's looking at uh, dealing with uh, uh, rights, hold, uh, rights holders to really show what they can do and show that even if they are disruptive, that that is not a, th a complete threat that actually that's an opportunity for them. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the record company or the label or the rights holders, um, you know, you're talking to a number of those guys who are business development people, yeah. they're looking for income, they're looking for w different ways of using their rights. So you, you as the DSP have to show the value of your product to them, even if it means diminishing value in other areas. Good example being, you know, digital music distribution, 
might result in uh, diminishing values in physical music distribution. Uh, but ultimately, if that's the way things are going, there's no choice. But also, you know, you need to get on there to monetize that the, the digital distribution uh, aspects of it. Yeah, sure. And how important is it to demonstrate your product as well to prospective, uh, uh, you know, uh, rights holders that that you want to make a deal with as a startup? Is that really a big factor in in, in their decision as well? Uh, very much so. Uh, ultimately, uh, you think of uh, labels and content owners as the equivalent of investors. An investor doesn't invest in something that they don't, they can't see, um, unless unless the people behind that investment, uh, so in that product, has a track record. So ultimately, you're in a much better position if you can show your product, even if it's a prototype, even if it's you know in beta, um, so that there is a feel for the you know the design, the user interface, and what you're trying to achieve. That's great. Well, thank you so much, and until the next segment. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the DMT One to One show, and remember to check out digitalmusictrends.com for our weekly news show.